Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to speak uh, and to celebrate Alan's birthday. Uh, in preparation for this, I was trying to think back when did I first meet Alan, and I couldn't quite pull that from my brain. But I do know I've been at Tufts for over 20 years, and it must have been a while because uh, I, very early on in my time at Tufts, I invited Alan to come and, and give a talk. And this was pre, almost pre-GPS, pre, you know, maps on your phone kind of thing. And I'm waiting for him to arrive. I'm in my office. Where is Alan? Where is Alan? My phone rings. I'm lost. If you know anything about driving around in Medford, Somerville area, uh, all the roads just about are one way going the wrong way. <laughs> and I had to, I put a local on the phone to direct him to, to campus. So anyway. So. Uh, with that, uh, I wanted to, to talk today um, about a, a project that I've been working on. It's been an obsession, actually, for some time. Uh, this is joint work with uh, collaborators here that you see on the screen. Um, and I should also mention that I have a secondary affiliation at the moment. I'm a deputy director at the Institute for Computational and Experimental Research in Mathematics at Brown University. Uh, and so, unfortunately, I won't be here the whole, whole time because I'm in charge of something going on over there. Um, but I wanted to start by uh, basically making the case for the work that I uh, want to show you today, which is, uh, I, I don't think I have to, to, to work too hard to convince you that, you know, much of the real world data that we, we collect um, tends to be stored conveniently in multi-dimensional arrays. And uh, here's one example, hyperspectral images where wavelength is into the, into the board. Uh, something that I know a little too much about, these are my own MRIs of my knee last year when I blew out my ACL. Uh, you know, medical image data is, is uh, you know, third order array, fourth order array, depending on whether you have time and color and things like that. So, I mean, traditionally, what do we do with this data? Well, we know what to do with matrices and vectors, and we have lots of algorithms. Uh, so take these two-dimensional, this collection of two-dimensional objects, for example, and just vectorize them and put them in columns of a, a matrix and deploy our set of uh, matrix tools. But my goal today is to uh, show you that we can get more out of that uh, data set if we actually leverage high dimensional uh, structure in those data sets. And we can get better compression, better analysis. Uh, but that means that we need to come up with very new constructs uh, and those constructs had better lead to uh, efficient computation. So this is just an illustration of the case that I'm trying to make going from one to two dimensions. So in the, in the top right corner, I've just taken uh, two Gaussian random vectors, and I've taken their Kronecker product. And so what I'm displaying here is the intensities in that vector. Uh, if I just stared at that vector, it kind of even looks like a signal. I don't see the structure that's in that vector at all. But if I would wrap that information back up into a matrix and do a matrix factorization of this object here, uh, which I've you know, color-coded, the entries in the matrix, do a factorization, it's a rank one matrix. And since it's a rank one matrix, that's, that's basically telling me that if I would vectorize it, that's, that's where I get the Kronecker structure back out. So why is this nice? Well, that implies that the storage is reduced from mn to m plus n numbers, just by being able to access that kind of uh, structural information. So I want to do something like this and think about uh, how I can do it for higher dimensions, retain this higher dimensional format and use it to tease out the latent structure in the data. So notation-wise, um, if you're not familiar with the, the tensor literature, in fact, you probably have been dealing with tensors and, and not knowing it. Um, scalars, vectors, and matrices are zeroth, first, and second-order tensors, respectively. 
it just starts to get really interesting when we slap on higher dimensions. So, so a third order tensor is this cube and a fourth order tensor, however you want to think about it, maybe a collection of cubes and so on and so forth. So just higher order arrays. Uh, unless I specify otherwise, the norm that I'm referring to here is uh, the Frobenius norm, um, which is a natural way to, to it naturally generalizes to, to tensors. So the, um, there are different ways that I can carve up a tensor. Uh, and I have some pictures here to illustrate in particular how I'm going to do this for a third order tensor. So most of what I'm going to talk about today will involve third order tensors because that's the case that's easiest to basically describe and put on a set of slides. Um, uh, but a lot of what I'm going to say actually generalizes to higher dimensions as well. It's not as easy to demonstrate in a talk. Um, but I do need to be able to go back and forth between matrices, uh, tensors, vectors, and scalars from time to time. Uh, and so I have these different types of uh, notation for that. The calligraphic cal notation always is a, is a third order tensor. Um, and the way that I've carved up this particular third order tensor is as a set of matrices from front to back. Those I'll refer to as the frontal slices of the tensor. Um, it will also be important later on in the talk to understand uh, the meaning of lateral slices in the tensor uh, or tube fibers. So these are basically vectors going into the board. So these pictures are good to kind of keep in mind because ultimately what I want to try and do with this third order tensor is think of it as a matrix of tube fibers. So uh, the singular value decomposition, of course, in the matrix case is our traditional workhorse for doing dimensionality reduction or principal component analysis. Uh, you have data that you assume is somehow redundant, is compressible, uh, then you know you, you, the go-to is the singular value decomposition. And it gives us the ability to um, you know, make approximations which are optimal, optimal in the sense of the Eckert-Young theorem, for example, which uh, I have basically detailed on the bottom of this slide. If I have a singular value decomposition for the matrix A, and it has rank R, and I want to approximate it by something with, in a matrix that has rank P less than R, then I just need the components of the singular value decomposition, um, which I've expressed here as uh, weighted uh, outer products, and it will give me the uh, animal that minimizes this expression. Okay, So that's nice. Um, you know, from the point of view of if I just keep this implicit representation of B, I can think of it as, as a compressed representation. And if B is particularly small, then, then I get a, a decent amount of, of savings. So what is the extension to higher dimensions? When I throw on that third dimension, what should this kind of look like? So if you do a uh, search for uh, tensor decompositions, probably the first one that will come up is the candy comp parafac or the CP decomposition, which is basically an expression that says take, take this and approximate it by uh, the multidimensional version of a sum of rank one outer products. So this picture is meant to, to represent, so this is a rank one tensor basically. Um, and, and the rank of a tensor would be the minimal number of these things that I would need in order to be able to reconstruct that tensor exactly. And it seems like a reasonable thing to do because in the matrix case, you know, that's what we do. We write the SVD gives you a sum of rank one outer products. Unfortunately, the rank of a tensor, it's an NP hard problem to actually compute. Um, so in practice, people try to make an approximation based on what they know about the data set that they're working with, uh, try to optimize. 
and it runs into all kinds of uh, different problems with the alternating least squares uh, and, and different uh, routines. Um, there are really interesting, you can get a, you know, rank twos that converge to a rank three, all kinds of weird things that, that happen. But it, it has its place in practice sometimes, uh, works very, very well. Um, the other popular one that you might see is the um, Tuckerty composition or the variant that's known as a higher order SVD or HOSVD. Um, this thing, you can compute its exact uh, HOSVD, for example, in polynomial time. It just means unwrapping the, the tensor different ways, taking some matrix-based SVDs and uh, multiplying things in. You end up with a set of uh, factor matrices and a core tensor. And if you're lucky, um, you can truncate these uh, matrices in such a way that this is, in fact, a compressed representation of the tensor that you have. Unfortunately, just truncating the higher order SVD does not give you a result that's similar to the matrix case. It's not, it's not an optimal representation. Nevertheless, it sometimes works very well in practice. And there are a whole host of other types of factorizations uh, that, that are out there. But what was really bugging me when I got into this was that none of them was really linear algebraic. Like, I, you know, I work in numerical linear algebra, I wanted to be able to actually factor the, the, the cube into products of cubes. And so what can we do? So the idea um, is to think about um, go back to what I'm familiar with and think about uh, matrices and vectors and just add the dimension, right? So see if we can come up with a matrix mimetic way of, of thinking about these tensors. And whereas matrices are linear operators, we call tensors uh, T linear operators in this work. So in order to understand the product that I'm going to define, um, it's necessary to introduce one piece of notation, which is the um, mode three unfolding and the corresponding mode three product. So basically, if I have a, a, a tensor, it's mode three unfolding um, would be this type of matrix where I basically sliced laterally and then transposed and tucked those matrices in uh, next to one another. And so the mode three product of this tensor with a matrix M that has the appropriate dimensions can be obtained by finding the mode three unfolding, and then multiplying on the left by a matrix M. And then I get the tensor back by wrapping it up in the same order. And it, but it's mathematically equivalent to applying that linear operator to the tube fibers. Okay. So here is um, what we propose as a, a way of multiplying two tensors together. You give me any M, which is an invertible uh, N by N matrix, where N is the dimension into the board. Um, I'm going to define a tensor A hat by taking the mode 3 product with M. And I can always get that tensor back by multiplying by the inverse. And so if I have two tensors, say A and B, and I want to multiply them, I fix my M. I know now what my product is going to look like. I'm going to take each of A and B into this transform domain. And then I'm going to do individual uh, face-wise matrix matrix products, take the result, inverse uh, transform, and I end up with something um, that I'm going to call C. So this is nice in the very simple case where, in fact, these uh, A and B would be 1 by 1 by N. This is an operation which actually uh, commutes. So the tube, tube fiber multiplication is commutative. So we can go a step further. Once I've fixed M and I've fixed this product, I can define uh, what I mean by an identity. I can define what I mean by conjugate transpose. Uh, I can define what I mean by a unitary or an orthogonal tensor under this fixed product, which is really nice. And of course, Another useful fact is if I restrict myself to uh, multiplication where I define that matrix M as being a uh, multiple of an orthogonal or unitary matrix, then uh, 
if I have a unitary or an orthogonal tensor under that product, I can show a Frobenius norm invariance, um, which is very nice. Again, reminds me of familiar things from uh, linear algebra. And when I further restrict myself uh, to uh, talking about these choices of multiplication, where I fix the m and my m is a multiple, non-zero multiple of a, a unitary orthogonal matrix, then I can define what I mean by a tensor uh, singular value decomposition. So I can factor any tensor A now according uh, to exactly using uh, orthogonal U, orthogonal or unitary V, and a face-wise diagonal tensor S. So the picture I think hopefully makes a little more clear. So instead of singular values, now I have entire singular tube fibers. Um, but these singular tube fibers can be arranged so that they are, um, have this property, the, the largest uh, magnitude tube fiber is here and, and so on and so forth. So maybe you know where I'm going with this. <laughs> uh, I can think about it, certainly as expressing it in this kind of outer product form. In fact, if I took the, the third dimension away, it would look exactly like a matrix SVD. It would be a matrix SVD. Um, and in fact, we can get an Eckert-Young theorem now for this tensor. We can basically say if I want to approximate it to a kappa order terms, truncate this expression, um, that this expression is optimal over all such animals um, in this set M in the Frobenius norm. So it's pretty easy to, dis to write the code to do this. Um, I just need to do everything in the transform domain is where the work is and everything decouples. So I take um, my uh, matrix, uh, my tensor A rather, I transform it into the transform domain. I do individual SVDs and I can inverse transform, truncate and then inverse transform. And that's my truncated approximation. So perfectly parallelizable, um, very efficient uh, thing. And I can get back then to the spatial domain by this inverse transformation. So is there any advantage to doing this? I think it's kind of cool, but it's um, really interesting uh, to, to think about. Should I really go back to what I was doing before and vectorize it and factor this matrix? Or should I stack those you know, 2D images, for example, into a tensor and use this? Um, so this is sort of an open problem. I mean, folks that have been working in tensors for the last few decades, lots of applications where you can clearly see you get more by working with tensors than you do with uh, matrix, matrices, but it hadn't been proven. Um, uh, and uh, we did manage to say something about this in our recent um, paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, and the result is that if I compare basically the same data, so that's the data as a tensor versus the data unwrapped as a matrix, I can compare the K term TSVD, uh, tensor SVD approximation with the K term matrix approximation. This is an inequality which really isn't interesting unless you know that in fact strict inequality is achievable. And in fact, we can show that. I'll show you a simple example in a moment. Um, but this is a true statement independent of my choice of M as long as I take M to be a unitary or orthogonal um, matrix that defines that multiplication. Um, the way the proof works is basically to take the matrix SVD and we can put it into this star M product framework in order to do the proof. And when is it useful? Well, it's useful when there's latent structure in the data. So. First, a simple example. Here is uh, the matrix version, I'm sorry, matrix version of the data, tensor version of the data, and I can compare the uh, single term approximation to the tensor and get it exactly, whereas in the matrix case, the single term, this is not a rank one matrix. Okay. But in fact, um, so that was a simple example. Is this true more generally? Is there some utility here? And the answer is yes. 
Part of it is in the underlying um, structure that's induced by your choice of M. For example, if I look at this uh, product here, it's equivalent in matrix land to taking this thing and thinking of it as a matrix and post multiplying by a structured matrix. For example, if M is a discrete Fourier transform matrix, then this thing here is a, is a circulant matrix. Um, so this happens to have a lot of uh, beneficial features in applications like um, uh, uh, dictionary learning and so forth. Um, so in fact, if I had a tensor where every lateral slice had this kind of structure, then again, I could, I could capture that immediately um, with a single term of this approximation. And it wouldn't work for other choices of M. M would be tailored for that. So in practice, of course, things are not going to be as nice as these couple of examples. And we, we really need to do some um, compression. We don't have a good way of determining how big is that uh, inequality or that strict equality when it exists. Um, and in fact, those, those, um, the tensor, the thing I swept under the rug was that the tensor approximation is, is not as compressible as the matrix one for the same K. So can we do a little better? And the answer is yes, because to this point, I have uh, ignored the uh, relative importance of the, um, the faces to one another. So if I go back and I look at what's going on where the work is being done in the transform domain, I have these individual singular value decompositions. What I really should do is look at the values and compare all the singular values and you know, decide how many of those do I really need to keep in order to keep um, you know, the, some energy in the, in the data set. Um, so it turns out that if I use a smart choice of M relative to the data set, you may in fact find that a lot of the most meaningful information is in this A hat tensor is really ends up in these, say the first few uh, frontal slices. So you do get more compression um, and so this is a, just an illustration of um, I'm keeping the things basically in, in the color and everything that's been grayed out is the things that I'm going to throw away. And so we call such an approximation a, a multi-rank approximation in the sense that we know what the rank is of the approximation that we're keeping um, for each face. And we can get an Eckert-Young theorem for that type of two in the sense that we have a best multi-rank um, approximation in the Frobenius norm with an approach <laughs> like this. And I can compare this now with, uh, in fact, the, the uh, kappa term uh, tensor approximation that I had previously. I get a string of inequalities um, in the worst case, this, this would be equal. But if I use a good choice of M, as I'll show you in one quick example in a, in a moment, um, this is, this is uh, a lot smaller, and the compression is a lot greater. So to illustrate this, this is um, the Yale faces data set. We put the faces in as lateral slices. And what I'm showing here is the choice of M matters. This is an illustration, and then it's an illustration of, of the theory. Basically, where you want to be on this curve, let's see, let's pick a, um, OK. So for this, for 10% error, these two curves correspond to a great deal of compression. So the, you're better off on these, the, the upper curves. And the upper curves correspond to using this um, approach that I just described. In one case, I've used M as a discrete cosine transform. In one case, I've used M as a hard wavelet transform. Um, and I'm comparing that against, uh, well, the matrix case uh, approximation that is this blue curve down here. It doesn't do very well. Uh, and this is a tensor approximation. But here I've just chosen M so that I, I, ran, I generated a, a random Gauss, uh, Gaussian matrix. And I took a QR factorization. And that, that Q is my M here. And you see that I'm not really, I didn't expect to get much. And I'm not getting much because I'm not tapping into the latent structure in the, in the data set at all with that choice. 
So um, just quickly, this was a you know a lot of a fun project. Um, I love that it's matrix mimetic, and uh, I can you know generalize a lot of the numerical linear algebra algorithms that I have to this framework. It's parallelizable. This does extend by recursion, the multiplication, right? Recursion to higher dimensions. Um, you know, we were able to solve some open problems and uh, in tensor in its tensor framework, but it's not the end of the story. I think there are a lot of uh, interesting uh, questions. I, I get asked, you know, can we learn what M should be for a particular data set? I think that's an interesting question. Um, can I say something further? Can I get strict inequalities with some other uh, constraints? Um, I can make a comparison with other sort of famous tensor methods uh, with different with certain choices of M. Um, and if you know moving from a matrix to a third order tensor got me better compression, should I be looking at higher dimensions? So uh, lots of interesting questions. I will say I was teaching at a graduate summer school uh, last week and was talking about some of this work and the student said, do you have a toolbox for this? And I say, no, what toolbox would you, you know, what language would you like to see? And they said, Julia. So with that, <laughs> conclude, thank you. So I know like the there's the classic like intro linear algebra where you say SPD makes a good image compression mm -hmm. and it doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, does this make a good image compression? Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we can do this. Um, we can do compression on images, on video, on other types of higher order um, data as well that aren't from those cases. Um, but it has to have some structure that you know how to leverage and you can design an M to take advantage of that. Yeah, but like, I guess yeah. my question is like, have you tried this on like a 1080p YouTube video and seen how it does? On a what? Like 1080p YouTube video? Yeah. No. Okay. No. I think the SPD makes it okay, but not a great image. Yeah. Sure, not a level. Yeah, right. it's, not, it's not awful, but it's not yeah. good. Uh, in these, uh, in the Right. So this is the thing. We get we get a, a drop off in each face, um, but then relative um, relative face wise in a relative comparison, you all if you've chosen M correctly, you also get that that interesting information and is all the largest singular values in total are in the first few frontal slices. That's how you really achieve the compression. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm, um, so I'm wondering, I have lots of questions, but I'm wondering, like, how does this differ from something like the Parafac 2? Or like, uh, you know, it looks very similar to things in chemistry we use, like paranatural orbital theory mm -hmm. or you know, like if we expand this and do it on every mode, we might recover something like a Tucker tra uh, tensor train or MPS. Right. There, there is a relationship between some of these decompositions that I can t we can talk about offline, but it isn't. A, it is not a pair effect to per se. I, I can liken it 